Hello students of Dynamics, this is Dr. Dan Baker, and today we're moving into a new topic, a new chapter, and that topic and chapter is called Particle Kinetics. Okay, so the transition we're making is from particle kinematics, which is particle motion, pure motion, all position, velocity, and acceleration, into now kinetics fundamentally relates the motion to forces. Okay, so we're bringing in those forces. We're going to need free body diagrams because we're bringing in these forces, and we'll talk about those details, kind of lay those out here in this first lecture. I do want to present that the chapter that we're working through, which is Newtonian particle kinetics, is not the only chapter, not the only topic that focuses on kinetics and dynamics. There's actually three of them. And these three are looking at a Newtonian approach, which is basically an acceleration-based approach. There's also a work energy approach, which is a velocity and distance-based approach. And finally, there's impulse momentum, which is a force, velocity, and time-based approach. Okay, and I'll, there'll be a, some summary documents that'll show these. You can actually look at your review sheet uh, for this class and kind of see a contrast between these different types. I don't want to get into all those details right now just because I want to overwhelm you um, with, with all the details. But just to show you that this is the introductory lesson to kinematics, excuse me, to kinetics in general, and that you can solve any problem, any dynamics problem whatsoever, using this acceleration-based or Newtonian approach. Okay, so let's unpack these words, Newtonian particle kinetics. And so to start with kinetics, kinetics means that we are relating forces to motion. And I'm actually going to go through these kind of reverse order. Particle means a couple of different things. Now, it could mean tiny bodies of mass, but the reality is that there, there is no physically tiny bodies of mass that exists. And so, the honestly, the kind of bodies that we're dealing with for our particle kinetics are non-rotating bodies. with concurrent forces. Okay, non-rotating bodies with concurrent forces. And I'll bring up an equation to really justify why this works um, in order to treat these bodies as particles. And then finally, Newtonian refers to our good friend Sir Isaac Newton and his second law. So essentially he says in his second law is to use the sum of all the force vectors is equal to the mass scalar times the acceleration vector. And so essentially we're using this equation, acceleration based equation versus work energy or impulse momentum. Okay, so um, as we get into work energy and pulse momentum, that will still be particle kinetics. It will just not be Newtonian particle kinetics. Okay, so let's take a little bit more detailed look at Newton's second law. So once again, it is sum of forces, and these are force vectors. And this is equal to the mass times an acceleration vector. Now, as I write this equation, I really think about there being, I call it the line in the sand. There's a division across that equal sign that says the things on the left are equal to the things on the right, but the things on the left are different than the things on the right. So what we can do with diagrams is we can say that everything in your sum of forces comes from your free body diagram. And hopefully coming out of statics, you are free body diagram professionals. And then everything showing up on the left-hand side of your equation comes from your kinetic diagram. So your kinetic diagram is focused on your motion-based terms, right? Your accelerations or your velocities. And so when we set up a problem like this, it's nice to be able to set up either two separate diagrams. Now you can draw your kinetic terms and your force terms on a single body if you'd like to, but you'll need to make sure you indicate that your forces are in either a different color or a different line type than your kinetic terms. 
Now it turns out there's an additional equation that looks really similar to this one, but it's for rotational motion. And so the rotational version of this equation is sum of moments, can't forget about those moments, and that's equal to our i, right? Remember that um, moments of inertia are about a point, that's what this i is, is um, and this one's actually mass moments of inertia, and that's going to be about the same point that we're summing moments about, that times alpha. So the right-hand side of this equation, once again, the line in the sand, everything on the left-hand side comes from the free body diagram, over on the right-hand side of the diagram comes from the kinetic diagram. But luckily for myself and yourself included, we don't have to use this equation, the sum of moments equation, until the second half of dynamics as we get into rigid bodies. The reason for that are one of two things. Either the body's not rotating, so if it's, not, if it's not rotating, we can say that the angular acceleration alpha goes to zero, or possibly we actually are dealing with a particle. So this is like the classic definition of a particle of having all the mass in one little place, having no dimension whatsoever. And fundamentally, the particle has a moment of inertia equal to zero. Okay, so it's one or the other. Either the body's not rotating or the particle has a mass moment of inertia equal to zero. Therefore, we can stick to just the equation over here on the right, excuse me, on the left for particles. And we'll need to use both as we get into rigid bodies. All right, so taking a deeper dive at a graphical view of what sum of forces equals mass times acceleration really means, let's assume that we have a particle. And this particle is subject to some forces. So we'll say that we have a force one. Let me just go with a couple forces here. F2. And if I drew a additional free body diagram, I could draw this F1 and F2 as a resultant force, right? So let's say, let's say the resultant force looks something like this. We could write this as the sum of forces. So all we've done here is just say that this is the resultant. And that this resultant force then causes an acceleration. Now, one thing you'll notice about the Newton's second law equation is that there are vectors on both sides of that equal sign, right? Both here and also over here. And if there's vectors on both sides and the forces are causing this acceleration, it means that the forces have to be in line with the acceleration, okay? There would be no acceleration without those forces. Now, another thing to note about this system right here is that this is the mass. And the amount of acceleration can be scaled by the mass, right? The more mass you have, fundamentally, for a given force, the slower a system will accelerate. Okay, so let me put that into words because that's an important just general concept that for a given force, more mass yields less acceleration. And that's true no matter if it's linear acceleration, angular acceleration, that's just a very general dynamics kind of idea that the more mass we add, the less acceleration we'll have for a given force. All right, so if we think about this relationship, F equals MA, it turns out that F equals MA was never derived, right? So many different equations are derived, but F equals MA, or sum of forces as a vector equals mass times acceleration as a vector, is an empirical equation. And empirical means that it came from observation. It came from experiments. They actually observed if you applied a force to a particle with a given mass, you ended up with an acceleration. Now, until 1905, it was thought that Newton's second law 
So uh, this is back from the you know the 1600s when Newton came up with his second law until 1905. Uh, it was thought that Newton's second law applied to all particles and didn't matter what. But then came along a couple of folks. Uh, one of those was Einstein. And Einstein came up with this theory of relativity, and because of the theory of relativity, essentially was pushing the boundaries of you know, velocities up to the speed of light. And they actually found that because around the speed of light, there's some things about time being nonlinear. I'm not going to get into all those details. I quite honestly don't understand all those details. But Einstein found that Newton's second law fails at velocities... approaching the speed of light. Now, until we can actually move, you know, create systems or create mechanical systems that move up to the speed of light, we're not going to worry about this. Okay. And then the other group, essentially, that found another loophole in Newton's second law uh, comes from quantum mechanics. And in quantum mechanics, they study a lot of um, atomic size particles. And so when you have two atoms, so it, um, Newton's second law also fails when atoms move close to one another. So these two restrictions are probably not going to affect your career as an engineer because you'll be dealing with velocities that are much less than the speed of light, and you'll be dealing with particles or rigid bodies that are much larger than an atom. Okay, But it is just to point out that these are some limitations to Newton's second law. So the general process in order to compute a problem using Newtonian kinetics it's actually going to have a good number of similarities to what you did in statics, except for the fact you need to bring in knowledge of acceleration. Okay, So in statics, we said all this acceleration was equal to zero. Therefore, the right side of our equation always equal to zero, 100% of the time. But in dynamics, we need to consider that acceleration. And, and fundamentally, what we'll have is we'll have an imbalance of forces on a body. And that imbalance of forces will create acceleration. Okay, but the general process of first isolating a body is key, right? It's the same thing in statics as dynamics. Choose a body to isolate. Once you isolate that body, you need to create a free body diagram. We know that free body diagrams always add all the forces that are applied to a body, right? To a particle or a rigid body. If we cut that body away from other things as we isolate it we need to replace all those connections by our reactions right our forces and our couple moment reactions and noting that every problem where you some forces or some moments you need a free body diagram i'm going to put this in a blue highlighter every problem that you some forces or some moments you need a free body diagram this is true on homework this is true on quizzes this is true on exams 100 percent of the time that you are summing forces or summing moments for any reason you need a free body diagram. So fundamentally, that means that every problem you work in any of the kinetics chapters for either particles or rigid bodies, so it's the second quarter of dynamics or the fourth quarter of dynamics, you will need a free body diagram. Once you've created this free body diagram, then pick a coordinate system that idealizes the terms in the free body diagram and also the motion of the problem. So in statics, all we had really had to worry about was the forces that were in the problem. But as we get into dynamics, and we here we have a combined free body diagram and kinetic diagram with my kinetic term drawn. Now you can either draw the kinetic term or label it as just the acceleration or the mass times the acceleration. Fundamentally, these are going in the same direction. Mass is just a scalar you're multiplying times your acceleration. Uh, I'll leave it up to you on which one you want to label. But here's my free body diagram of a block. I'm sitting on a non-smooth surface. This is a rough surface with some friction. The weight force pulls down toward the center of the Earth. The normal force is perpendicular to that surface. The pulling force in this case happens to be horizontal. And given this information, I'm going to have an acceleration going down this slope. 
Okay. So once I create this free body diagram, kinetic diagram, it is based upon this diagram that I then write my sum of force equals mass times acceleration equations. On this problem, I have chosen to use a rotated coordinate system. Now, the reason that I like a rotated coordinate system on this problem, so we'll call x going this direction and y going this direction here, is that I'm then able to leave 100% of my acceleration in one equation and not split it into both. Okay, so I can see what happens in my equations is that here I have acceleration in the y is equal to zero. And so that's convenient because then I can look at my sum of forces equals MAY, and it becomes more like a statics problem, right? Because sum of force in the Y is equal to zero. So that's the approach I often like to take. You could use horizontal vertical for your X and your Y. The problem would work out the same way. And then as you continue to work on the problem, you may not have enough equations for your unknowns purely from these two um, Newtonian kinetics F equals MA equations. So you might need to bring in equations from kinematics, which fundamentally is from particle kinematics, particle motion in your previous chapter, and or friction, right, which can give you, if you know you're at impending motion, or luckily in dynamics, a lot of times we're in kinetic um, motion, and so we're going to have F equals mu times N, um, and that mu will either be static or kinetic, depending on if it's moving or non-moving, static or kinetic. And then we're using, they're going to solve these unknowns, and these are common sense, right? If you get answers to your problem that are orders of magnitude different than the input values, you know, it may not make sense. Um, I think it's also really good to kind of forecast directions of things even before you put numbers to the problem so that you can think about, well, oh, I think it's going to be about this value and, uh, and roughly in this direction. And if you get an answer that's different than that, you'll know you maybe need to go back and check your work. So that is the generalized process for Newtonian kinetics. One last thing before we fin wrap up this video is to revisit something I said earlier in the video. Okay, and so the question posed, which system accelerates faster and why? Okay, so there's system A. System A has a, and basically these are identical pulleys. You could assume they're massless. You could assume that they have mass. Let's in this case assume that they're massless. We won't have to worry about rotational inertia. So we have massless frictionless pulleys for both system A and system B. System A has a 10 pound weight block pulling down the left-hand side. It has a 15 pound force, not a block, just a force pulling on the right-hand side. On B, we have a 10 pound block on the left, a 15 pound block on the right. So my question for you, I want you to go ahead and pause the video, see if you can answer this question and describe to yourself why, and then restart it. Welcome back from your thought interlude. So it turns out that their accelerations are not the same. It turns out that the acceleration, purple on this, the acceleration of system A, so A, Y of system A, is greater than the acceleration in the y direction of system B. The reason it is greater has everything to do with the fact that there is not a mass, an additional 15 pounds divided by 32.2 feet per second squared to get a value in slugs. There is no mass associated with this 15 pounds. Therefore, system A has less mass. System B has more mass. Because system B has more mass, it will accelerate slower than system A. Okay, and we could, we could solve this problem out by essentially creating our free body diagrams, um, creating our kinetic diagrams, establishing an axis system, summing forces. In this problem, everything's moving in the y direction, so you can get by with one equation with one unknown, and you can go ahead and solve for your accelerations. It turns out that for system A, and you could back this up with your computations if you wanted to, the acceleration in the y direction is equal to 16 feet per second squared, and the acceleration for B, acceleration Y, I guess label as AYA, AYB, turns out only to be 6.44 feet per second squared. Okay, so of course, both of these are less than gravitational acceleration. Gravitational acceleration is in free fall. Both these systems are slowed down by something happening on the far side. 
but that something here on system A is a 15 pound force. So another way we can think about these is that sum of forces as a vector is equal to mass times acceleration in the y direction as a vector. Both of these systems would have exactly the same equations on the left hand side, right? Remember this line in the sand concept that there's all forces on the left and then there is kinetic action going on on the right. So it's exactly the same forces on both of these systems on the left hand side of Newton's second law. But on the right hand side, the difference is here, right? There is a smaller mass in system A than system B. So feel free to go ahead and work that out if you'd like to. Um, I appreciate your attention in this video and I hope you're having a great day.